Hello, my name is Tom Mason. I'm a professional wildlife and nature photographer, a Nikon Europe optics ambassador. And today I'm here to talk to you at the photography show about local wildlife photography. Now, of course, over the last year, many of us have been stuck close to home in lockdowns, everything like that. We haven't had the chance to venture to the locations that we might often head out to for our wildlife photography. Most of my international trips have been completely canceled and I haven't gone anywhere for months but it doesn't mean that I can't make some really great images. You know, the areas around our homes, um, our gardens, uh, the fields around them, they're really great places to make images of wildlife. It doesn't matter if you're in an urban area or a rural area, there's always opportunities to work with your local subjects. And for me, um, in terms of the way that I've developed my shooting over the last few years, I'd say that the areas around your home are not only great for taking pictures, but they're certainly some of the most important if you want to develop your shooting and really push your images forward. Now, as a photographer, having traveled to different locations, I've photographed jaguars, penguins, all sorts of stuff. But when you go on these big international trips, you've got a very limited time frame to do it. If you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to make the most of them. And so if I want to try anything new, any new ideas or techniques, I'll always trial them at home first. We're going to be talking about a few different ideas and way that you can make images of wildlife um, throughout this talk. But before we get into that, the first thing I want to get started on is a really simple project that basically anyone can do, and that's to photograph garden birds. Now, I've been photographing garden birds for, wow, like 10 years or so and each year I come back to it um, in order to just develop my portfolio a little bit more. A local project that you can do basically anywhere is a very simple one to set up but one that can have a really great yield in terms of images. You know when we head out onto locations and um, new places areas like that sometimes we get a shot sometimes we don't but if you want to develop um, a great portfolio of pictures you've got to have consistency in the work that you're doing and that's why having a project that's right on the doorstep is absolutely ideal for this. It means that you can make the most out of 15 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in your lunch hour, you know, any time that you've got available and still come back with a set of shots that are going to be great. Now today I've got a very simple setup. I've got a couple of feeders um, and a perch that I've put into position. And this is a great way for anyone to get started. Um, to find a perch, what you want to think about is the type of subjects you want to uh, photograph. You know, if you're looking for um, small birds, you know, blue tits, great tits, anything like that, you're going to want a quite thin perch. Here's one I found earlier. You know, it's quite small, but it's got some nice lichen on it. It's a really good looking perch that's going to make some great pictures. Pair this with an out of focus green background and you're going to have a really quite nice shot. They're simple to put in position, just a couple of cable ties. And the one that I've got set up is ready to go. Position your feeders off to that side and the birds as they come towards the, uh, the feeders to get some food will likely perch on your location and you can get your shot. Now, when you're working, it is quite tempting to keep moving your position. You know, as the birds land on different trees to photograph in different places, but all you'll do is frustrate yourself as they finally land on your perfect perch. Um, and, and, you know, the shots around it just aren't going to be as good. The shot that you've engineered in terms of your perch, you can make sure that the background is far enough away to make sure it's really nicely out of focus and even matching in terms of color palette. Now I've got a little simple set up and the birds are coming into it, but by locking off and just making sure my composition is set, I know that as the birds land, I can just get that picture, make it a few times, repeat it um, for like 20 minutes, half hour, and then maybe change it up. And this is a great way to start developing a really nice portfolio of pictures right on the doorstep. Now, if you're really stuck at home and you can't even get into the garden, you can even do this from a window, a feeder set up or anything like that. You can even put a wide angle camera close in. You can make some great images with houses in the background, all sorts of different stuff. And it really is quite a nice one to develop you thinking creatively as a wildlife photographer. It gets you in the mindset of actually setting pictures up rather than just going out and just looking for animals where they already are. You can really think about the way that they're coming into an area, the different locations they're going to sit, the type of perch you want, backgrounds, foregrounds, all very good things to be thinking about if you want to develop your images and really improve the sort of shots that you're taking. Now, in addition to just having good perches and stuff like that, the reason that it's great to have it right on the doorstep is to react to any climatic conditions. You know, over the last few weeks, we've had some snow, we've had some rain, sleet, all sorts of stuff, but they're perfect chances to get out and make different pictures. In, if you've got something close to home that's right on the doorstep, 
If it snows suddenly, you've got something you can get out and shoot. If it's heavy rain, the conditions are really interesting, you can get out and shoot. You've got something pre-arranged, pre-set up, you can just get the camera in position and make some images. And that means that every bit of your day, you can really have a high yield in terms of the images you're getting. It's really great for anyone who doesn't have that much time, but really wants to develop their shot and make great images rather than heading off um, to different places all the time and only coming back with a handful of lucky shots. This is a much more consistent and focused way to do it. And if you're wanting to kind of go around the route to uh, becoming a professional photographer, it, that consistently is certainly something you need. So when it comes to this style of shooting, it pays to keep it as simple as possible. With the garden feeder, um, just use one perch um, in your key position. I've just got my nice lichen covered stick um, right in the middle. Um, it gives me the best separation from everything around the outside, meaning that when the birds come towards it, I can move my composition a bit as well. I can shoot horizontally um, or vertically and still have space between my feeders and my stick with that nice clean foreground and background. I've got feeders above it that's just to kind of attract birds into the area, but the one below it is the key. Um, using the fat ball, it's the one that the birds are really going after and having it lower than the stick means that they'll come to my perch before dropping down onto the feeder. Um, that's a really good way to have it set up. And all I've got to do is simply stand here behind my tripod um, consistently over time and the birds will get used to it. Um, obviously I stand here quite a bit so the birds are pretty frequent but when you're getting started it might take a little while for them to get used to you in your position. Now if you've got an area of the garden that you can use for this the whole time, you can even set up something like a hide. Um, it's a great opportunity because the birds will get very comfortable and then you're going to have very regular activity to photograph. But for me this is really easy just standing out in the open. The tripod provides a little bit of concealment, they're used to it and because I'm standing in the same spot all the time, um, they're regularly coming back um, for my feeder and, and onto the perch. That makes for some really great pictures. Now after you've shot your perch for maybe a couple of days or something like that, you can then just switch out. Um, I just use reusable cable ties because I just take them off, put them back on. Uh, it's a really easy, simple way to do it. I've just got it attached to the fence there. Um, super simple and you can just make some really great shots right at home. Right, I better get back to it. So a couple of hours has absolutely flown by standing here photographing some garden birds. A variety of species have been dropping by, common birds, blue tits, grey tits, all settling on my perch before coming down to the feeders, making for some really nice image making opportunities. I'll probably switch the stick out over the next couple of days and get some different pictures. It's a really nice one to get started. But of course garden birds aren't the only wildlife we can find close to home. So let's go see what else we can find. So then, moving out of the garden, I've come to the local fields around home. And no matter where you live, there's countless opportunities to go and photograph wildlife. Whether you're in a rural location, urban areas, there is always going to be a host of different subjects right on the doorstep. It's just really important to get out and scout locations to find areas where you can photograph them. Now today, I'm just kind of walking along the hedge line. I'm looking for tracks and trails and signs that wildlife is moving through an area. You know, when you go out and take pictures um, as a professional photographer, often what we'll do is we we'll scout places well ahead of a time. You're not gonna just wander around looking for your subjects. You already know roughly where they're going to be. You even worked out the fields, the location, the way that the sun's gonna track, all of those things ahead of time to make sure that when you're in position, you're going to get the best opportunities for the shots. Now, today I'm looking for hares and other wildlife around home. I know a few good locations for it, but really this is about just developing those and, and seeing if there's any changes in the habitat at the moment. I might find some new subjects that I could work with or just different areas with the ones I already know to develop that portfolio again. It's a really important thing to do. And if you're starting out in wildlife photography, it's certainly something good to get used to. Now, one of the key piece of equipment um, that I've got, you know, before I even get the camera out, is that of my binoculars. They're probably the most important tool I have outside of the camera for finding locations and looking for wildlife. They give me an extended view, um, magnified so I can scout out and scan areas uh, for different subjects. They also give a very pleasurable viewing experience. You don't have to strain through the single viewfinder, anything like that. They just give you a very um, good magnified uh, vision of what's about. 
They're very compact, you can take them with you wherever you go. And I often find that I just have them with me all the time. It means that if I'm driving around the car in the local area and I spot something out of the window, I can look at it, decide if it's gonna be a good location or if that subject's just moving through. It might help me uh, track down a different subject to a different position I can come back to later with the camera. It really is useful indeed. They're also super handy when you're out with the camera in hand. If you're static in a position, you can uh, spend a lot of time viewing uh, up what's up in front of you. Find your subjects before they spot you and make sure that you're ready to act on using the camera. A lot of the time, uh, especially when the light gets low, they're super handy for just spotting that little bit of movement in a hedge line uh, so you can really find your subjects when you're on location. I certainly wouldn't be without mine. But today I'm just using them to scout some different places, different locations that might work for great future photography projects. So I thought what I'd do is show you some of the things I'm looking for and the ways that I think about locations for photography ahead of coming back to actually shoot the pictures. So then as I've been moving down the hedge line, there's been a variety of signs of wildlife. I've spotted some birds through my binoculars and even a hare off across the field. But looking for the signs of wildlife that are down in the vegetation are key things to think about when we're setting up for photography. There's been a variety of little tracks and trails uh, through the hedge here. And this in front of me is a very obvious uh, fallow deer track. These are really great places to think about shooting because what they are is these kind of natural bottlenecks where animals are moving between habitats. These locations offer really great places to scout out and kind of stalk for wildlife moving uh, between environments and they can be really good positions to come back to consistently. Now in front of me the fallow deer track is rather small. To be honest there's a lot of larger ones in this area that would probably be better positions. If this was a badger track, however, it'd be pretty nice and wide and showing that um, there's a good movement and number of, of badgers moving through. Again, an important thing to consider that when you're looking for tracks and trails, consider the size of them, how often they're used, um, as this is going to be a good indication if something's worth coming back to regularly and if the subjects really are going to be here in any kind of consistent capacity. But to think about this shoot and how we'd set up, it's a good one to talk about some of the other elements that we need to think about. Now the deer um, would be crossing from one field to the other. This means that this location, um, we, could, we could shoot it as they're coming through. So thinking about the different things, firstly the, um, the wind direction. Now the wind's coming from my right to left, that means that largely I'd want to be on this side of the hedgerow. It's going to mean that my subjects aren't going to get spooked, they're not going to catch my scent before they get into position, and that's going to give me a much better chance at getting close to them. The next thing to think about is that of the lighting. Now the sun is up to my right hand side but it's going to track behind me and off to the left. Um, that basically means that I want to position myself down behind me to get the best of that lighting. It's going to give me light all the way to the end of the day to get me right into that last kind of half an hour when most of our wildlife tends to be out and about. So this would be a pretty good location for that. I'd also probably want to site myself down here because it gives me two options for photography, or well, three actually. Um, the first one is of course the animals moving through the ditch and coming out of this little track to this point here. The next one is the animals coming down the track straight towards me. Uh, in arable land like this, wildlife often tends to stick around the outside of the fields, using the field margins to move around and move between areas. So this is a really good one. You can see that there's quite an obvious track down this side and that's not just made by myself walking around. It's often the deer and hares and everything moving along it as well. And of course the third option is the field itself. So after the animals have maybe come out and they move onto the field, I've got another option to shoot. And so maximizing my potential in that position means I've got a variety of images that I can make from one location uh, rather than just one single shot. So it could work out quite well. And this is certainly something that's worth thinking about as you're walking around scouting locations to find places that are worth coming back to to set up for your photography. So I've just stopped to have a quick look over one of the locations that's certainly been the most fruitful for me over the last year. 
one of the key kind of photographic projects that I've been working on close to home during the uh, number of lockdowns we've had is that of working with brown hairs. They've always been one of my favourite subjects to photograph. They're so fun to get out and shoot. They make for some really beautiful pictures. And they're just a really classic Hertfordshire kind of wildlife that's nice to be. And something I've photographed uh, since I was very young indeed. But this area is an ideal spot for seeing them. There's a good population of hares that I scouted out beforehand. There's at least five or six that use this field regularly. Um, and also the location offers a variety of different possibilities for images. At the moment, obviously, it's very brown and, you know, there's no vegetation in it yet. That's kind of that first shoot of the year. Uh, getting that kind of brown on brown look of a hair on this would be rather nice. But as the vegetation starts and grows in the next couple of weeks, um, it's going to give me some good opportunities for clean images, clean portraits, uh, with a little bit green in the foreground and background um, for those really simple shots. But then as we go through the summer and the vegetation gets longer, I can pick them out with... Um, you know, kind of looking through little views or the gaps in the field or the tram lines that will be there. More options for pictures as, as things develop. The location's also great as um, off to my right hand side, the field dips quite a bit. That means that if you're lying low on your front to get close to the hairs, you can actually shoot straight up and almost uh, have the sky as a background. Something that's ideal for high key images that was something that I was going after last year. Uh, something a little bit different to add to the portfolio. Now the way that I've been working with the hairs is one of uh, quite simplicity and it's great that I'm close to home to do it. A lot of the time when I'm coming out to photograph something like this, especially if it's right on the doorstep, you want to travel as light as possible. Today I've got a couple of bits and bobs with me um, because I'm scouting a few locations and um, looking at different things. But for when I'm doing the hairs most of the time, I just bring one camera and lens. Um, my 300mm 2.8 um, and my main camera body that's the D850. Now this means that I've got quite a small and concise setup that allows me to move quite freely across the field. I'm stalking them actively to get close for the pictures and so I need something that is flexible to work in this sort of way. I can't have too much with me, too much heavy gear to lug across the field um, and if I want to be dynamic in my positioning this works really nicely. What I tend to do is just lie down on my front and move forward uh, slowly and looking at the behaviour the whole time in order to work out when you can approach a bit closer. A key thing to think about with any animal as you're moving is when they're feeding. You know, if an animal is feeding and it's kind of stopped and feeding, it's probably pretty comfortable at that time. It gives you an opportunity to move a little bit nearer to get in for those pictures. Every time it bobs down and feeds, I'd move a little bit closer, slowly stalking my way across the field until I'm into that of photographic reach. As I move across the field, I also want to take pictures regularly, not only to get a shot as I'm moving and get some different options from more kind of environmental portrait to those close in ones, but also to just get them used to the sound of the camera. If you say dead quiet and then fire off a boatload of shots when you're uh, finally close, you're going to spook things. So get them used to the sounds as you're moving. Um, and I found that worked so well. One thing I would often do is have spare batteries, memory cards, and my teleconverter in my pocket. Um, and that means that you're carrying hardly anything. And you've got a very low profile. I wouldn't really drag my camera bag with me across the field because yes, it's handy having a few other lenses, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a lot more commotion, anything like that, that's gonna be a problem if you're trying to get really close up with your subject. A lot more of the time, if I want multiple photographic options, what I'll do is I'll find a site, um, you know, up on the corner of the other side of the field, it's really good because the hairs congregate that way. And then I just bed in and wait for my subjects to come close to me. If maybe uh, you find it hard to crawl across this sort of stuff and that's gonna be something difficult, finding a location where you can just sit and wait might be a better way uh, to, to let the wildlife get close. But by being flexible and moving on my front, I can kind of change the style of image that I'm getting through the day and develop my portfolio as I go. Now, of course, uh, with all that work of crawling across the field, I'm probably only getting five or maybe 10 minutes with the hairs a day. So consistency is absolutely key. Coming back time and time again, uh, spending nearly six weeks doing this all the time uh, to get a nice portfolio of pictures. But because it's right on the doorstep, only like five minutes from home, you can really get out and make the most of any opportunity when the light's good, the weather's good, uh, and come and shoot some shots. Um, it's really great for um, making those images. 
And the one thing that I always tend to do is review those pictures at home, look at them together as a set, and think about what I might need next to build out my portfolio for something a little bit more interesting. The more regularly you do that and try for something new, you're going to build a really nice, interesting uh, portfolio of shots. Uh, that are great for you know, having more of a story of your subjects rather than just the same shot over and over again. But right now I'm just kind of looking through my viewfinder, working out where I might position myself over the next couple of weeks as the hair action really starts to kick off again this spring, March being one of the perfect time to get out and shoot them. So then as the rain's coming in, you know, this afternoon's been a good opportunity to scout some local locations. The gaps in the hedges where the animals have been moving through and the pathways down the, the, the field margins and also having the chance to scout the fields with my binoculars to find the hares and I'm hoping to photograph over the next couple of weeks and have been photographing for the last year. Um, it's a really good time to kind of think about my photography going forward and really envisage the images that I want to create. Now I know that for a lot of people, this time uh, to just spend hours out in the field just looking at areas to photograph is something that you might not have. And so for those people, one thing that I'd certainly recommend is picking up a couple of these trail cameras. Now I use these all the time for scouting locations and um, giving me a, a number of eyes on any area um, so I can watch multiple places at the same time. I'll go to the places that I kind of scouted out, you know, those crossover points, those bottlenecks of activity, and I'll position a camera in that spot. Then I can leave it for two, three weeks at a time, and it'll just kind of video as animals move past using its passive infrared detector. These are ideal for just getting an indication of species that are moving in, consistency that they are moving there, and how long and the way that they move in that certain place very important stuff for then coming back and photographing it. Sometimes you'll find that a location that you thought was yeah, all right actually turns out to be brilliant and other places that you thought were going to be absolutely perfect have none of the subject or activity that you thought. So they really are good for helping you not waste any time out in the field. Now when I position them there are a couple of tips that's certainly worth talking about. Firstly I always have them pointing down and not across. Um, it just means that you get a lot less false triggers from changing um, you know weather conditions. Bright light send, tends to uh, set the trigger off on these and you just get you know many 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 hours of video of just nothing rather than the subjects you're looking for. And the second thing is to not put them uh, anywhere where there's long grass because that just triggers these off as well. But other than that, they're a great tool uh, for getting out and finding what's in your local area. I think that all wildlife photographers should have these just for um, the enjoyment factor of seeing what wildlife's knocking about and be in the garden, fields around your house, anything like that. They really are good to use. And with their timed um, date stamp and everything like that, they can give you some really good consistency and information about what time and where to be uh, for the certain subjects you're looking for. I certainly wouldn't be without these in my kit. But now, as the rain started falling, I thought about the ideas for my telephoto lenses. It's time to think about other ways that we can photograph wildlife close to home. And some of the different styles and shooting uh, opportunity we have here that we might not have at more distant locations. But I think tomorrow is gonna to be the perfect one out. So I'll see you in the morning when we're gonna be heading off for some camera trapping. So what a difference a day makes. The rain's gone, the sun's out, it really is starting to feel like spring. And I've come to a location that I've scouted out over the last week as a possible place to put in a remote camera for my photography. Now so far we've been talking about you know birds in the garden, hares in the field, often using long lens to get close uh, to those subjects and make our images. But when we're working close to home, it's also a great place to experiment with our photography, um, to use wide angles or, or different lenses to really make something a little bit more interesting. And remote camera traps are a fantastic way to make environmental portraits of wildlife uh, within their habitat. And that's what I'm gonna be setting up today. So this is the location where I'm gonna be setting up my remote camera this afternoon. Uh, I found this Badger set a few, uh, well, about a year ago really, and investigating it at the time, it really wasn't that active. A lot of the trails were kind of, um, you know, the vegetation had grown over them, so I knew there wasn't really that much going on. But over the last month or two, I've been coming back and visiting, and it's really increased in that terms of activity. 
the paths have become a lot wider, regularly visited and, and used by the badgers. You can see that there's fresh debris that's been brought in and it changes every day. That means there's probably quite a lot of activity going on here that hopefully means it's gonna be an ideal place to set up one of my remote camera traps. The first job I need to do is have a look around, work out where my composition uh, might work best before I can get the camera gear out and start setting up my trap. So having looked around the set, there's certainly some great activity going on, um, but these two main trails look like they're gonna be the ideal place for my camera trap. There's a lot of activity on them and they act as this natural bottleneck between the two sides of the set, meaning that I'm gonna get more activity. Because they're also a bottleneck, it means that I can be very precise in terms of my focus and trigger position that it's more likely to provide that perfect shot that I'm after. If there's too much area for movement for my subjects to be either side, they might be out of the frame or not where I want them to be compositionally. So having these areas where they're kind of channeled through a certain point um, is ideal for this style of shooting. This section with its larger size um, probably isn't as good as the smaller track around there. And that one also offers a bit more of a picturesque background. It's gonna be more of a hassle to set up for sure, but with this sort of photography, you're not doing it uh, quickly. You're not gonna rush it because the camera is gonna be in position for a couple of weeks, maybe a month to get the images you're after. So time spent now um, really working methodically to think about your composition, lighting, everything like that is key to make the most success out of this style of picture. But when you get the shots, they're certainly worth all the effort. So then before I get started installing it, I thought I'd just run you through the equipment that I use for this sort of work. To start, we've got the camera in its camera box. Now, the box is made of a Pelican case or a hard case that I drill out with a filter on the front, and it gives a good protection for my DSLR. Now, the DSLR of choice I'm using is a pretty budget-friendly um, secondhand Nikon D3300. I tend to use secondhand equipment for this because when you're leaving it out, um, you know, for long periods of time, the likelihood is eventually your equipment will succumb to the damage of the environment. I've lost multiple cameras over the years, but the images I've got out of them have definitely been worth, uh, worth that loss. And I find that even these entry level cameras can be ideal for this sort of shooting. The 18 to 55 mil kit lens here has provided all sorts of images for me from um, little owls and badgers, even up to jaguars in the rainforest. So I know they work very well indeed. And the 24 megapixels, this uh, kind of more modern entry level cameras uh, offer a great image quality too. So that's set up in here, so it'll give me nice weatherproofing and it probably will uh, last for a good few months, especially with the battery life in those cameras, they're ideal. Now, of course, we're working in the evening and that means that we're gonna have to use flash to get our subjects uh, nicely lit. And I have two older speed lights here, Nikon speed lights, in two tubes that I've made at home. I think one of the things that I love about camera trapping most is the kind of homebrew nature of it. You've got to come up with your own solutions for protecting your equipment or new ideas when it comes to shooting different scenarios. Um, and these I found to be really great. They're just motorbike manual tubes that a lot of people attach to the outside of a motorbike. They're waterproof and then I've just cut off the end and added a nice little perspex disc um, so the flash can come out and a hole that allows my, uh, my cables to run through. And probably the most important thing is that of the trigger. I'm using a beam trigger here. This is a, uh, creates an infrared beam that as the animal crosses, uh, it'll trigger off the camera and set off um, the camera and my lights. These are more expensive versions. This is the, um, the Kinesis Scout. Um, it offers a really great amount of customization in terms of um, the shooting number of shots it's gonna take, pre-trigger, all of these sort of things, time settings. Um, but you don't need something like this to get started. There's lots of other options from PIR sensors that are just a single-sided sensor um, to lower rate beam triggers that are kind of, you know, around the 60 to 80 pound mark. Whereas these are more um, kind of 350, 400 but I do a lot of this sort of work, so that's why I have them. And outside of that, just the wires and a couple of accessories for mounting my cameras, that's pretty much all I'm going to use for this shot. But the first thing to do is get my camera set up into the position that I think the shot's gonna be, and then we'll work the lighting in and set everything up from there. It's gonna take a while, so I might just run a time lapse and then uh, show you the end result and walk you through how everything's gonna work when we get there. So I'll get cracking. Thank you. 
So as the sun is starting to get a little bit lower in the sky, the camera trap is ready to go. I've got everything set up, the camera, the composition's looking good. Focus is where I want it. My flashes are up above at a kind of 45 degree angle either side, one roughly in the foreground and one just behind the first tree limb to give me a little bit of separation in the frame. My camera trigger is set up across the line where I'm hoping the badger's gonna cross as it comes down this path, giving me the chance to get five images as it comes towards the camera, giving me a little bit more opportunity to get that perfect frame. You know, this sort of shot does take a while to set up. The couple of hours that I've spent here this afternoon um, is probably made quicker by the fact that I've done it rather regularly. When you first get started in this sort of image, you really wanna spend a lot of time making sure everything's perfect because when you're gonna leave the camera for a couple of weeks, you need to know that as you go through it, everything's gonna work first time. And that's why the last thing I've gotta do before I leave is crawl through the camera and make sure everything goes off. But looking at the system, it should be all ready to go. So I'll crawl through that and then we'll be able to leave this in the field and hopefully get some great images over the next couple of weeks. So then with the sun going down, the camera trap set up, that's about it for my talk at this year's photography show online. Hope you found it helpful with a couple of ideas uh, for improving and developing your local shooting, getting out and scouting places for different shots, even working in the garden with garden birds. There's a whole host of opportunities that you can get out and create. I will be around just after this uh, for a live Q&A where you can ask me anything that you've got on your mind, be it about camera gear, camera trapping, local projects, garden birds, whatever you want, I'll be there to answer the questions. But before I go, I just wanted to say, whatever you do over the next year, find yourself a local project and get out and shoot it. Spend a lot of time coming back to that same subject, getting out and enjoying the wildlife that's right on your doorstep. You'll find it a great opportunity to develop your pictures, learn and grow as a photographer, and even try to get images that might be impossible at other locations. It certainly is great fun to do, and something that for me as a professional photographer has definitely helped shape the way that I shoot and develop my own images. It certainly is the best thing I've ever done, and something I hope you all get out and do. Hi guys, uh, thank you very much for joining me uh, on, on this session. Um, what I'm gonna do now is just run through some of the questions that you guys have been asking. Um, so I can just answer some of the questions that have been through this session. So I'll get cracking because I don't have that long. Um, so firstly, the question was about how I um, you know, set up initially whenever I'm doing any of this work. Um, and for me, in terms of the camera settings that I usually have dialed in, um, when the camera is in the bag, when it first comes out, it's probably being around F4 uh, with a 500 of a second shutter speed and being ISO um, 400 or 800 if it's, it's rather dull out. That gives me a really good starting place to just work quickly from. I'm always in continuous focus and that just means I'm ready to you know, pull the camera out of the bag and immediately get shooting. Now, one of the next questions was about the, um, the lens that I would use for garden bird photography. I was recommending getting started. You know, if you're on a really um, tight budget, something like a 50, uh, five to 200 mil lens can be really good, um, especially if you can work close with your subjects in the garden. But something pushing up to like a 300 mil, be it 70 to 300, or maybe a 300 f4 is a stunning lens that I always talk about um, for people first getting into wildlife photography is a really good one to go for. Um, they can be, you know, found for about 500 quid, but they are absolutely superb uh, and a great investment going forward. Um, the backpack that I'm using is a um, Jitsu Adventure. Absolutely love it. It's really good. I can have all my personal gear in it as well as um, my camera kit that I need through the day. And it's super, um, uh, very versatile for whatever I'm working on when I'm out in the field. Um, my binoculars, well, they are probably one of my most important uh, pieces of equipment, and that is my Nikon uh, HGs. Um, these are the Nikon Monarch HGs. I've got the 8x42s here. Um, these are my kind of general pair that I'm using when I'm spending a long time staking out stuff uh, close to home. But I also use a uh, pair of 8x30s that are my kind of more travel pair. Um, they're smaller and they fit in the bag really nicely, especially for when I'm going uh, further afield. I, I pretty much carry them 
every moment of the day, wherever I am, no matter where I'm going, um, I always have them with me. In terms of magnification, um, I like an eight by pair rather than a 10 by pair because they match my 300 mil 2.8 a little bit better. Um, if you step up to a 10 by pair, um, they kind of more match a 500 or 600 mil lens. Um, and when I'm kind of scouting locations and working out how far to be away from my subject, uh, I, I tend to go for the eight buys there. One of the next big questions that I saw come out quite a lot about is permission. Um, when it comes to permission for wildlife photography, um, I'm always asking local landowners, getting in touch with them, getting access to certain fields and areas, be it for, you know, crawling across on my front to get close to wildlife or um, positioning camera traps or bush knolls, whatever it is. Um, I always ask first. You know, landowners are fantastic for it. Um, just going in, asking, being very polite and saying that you'd like to make pictures on their land. Very often you get a really nice response. You know, a crate of beer, a bottle of wine doesn't go amiss. And especially some pictures after you've been shooting there for a while. Um, it's certainly something that really helps cement that relationship and can really help um, grow your number of opportunities in your local area. Um, that is, is really good to have. Um, so in terms of another question that's here, um, is flash photography. You'll see that with my camera traps, I definitely use flash, but I also do use it when I've just got the camera in my hand. I tend to get it off camera as much as possible. Um, the reason for that is you just get a much more natural look to the image. If you put that flash off to this corner, looking down into the frame, uh, the, the light just replicates a lot more that we get from the sun or anything like that. So the final images resulting from it are, are, are a lot more natural. Try and uh, to lift your flash the whole time because when it's low um, with the camera, you tend to get very harsh shadows and um, it's very flashy if that as was this term it very looks like flash photography so lift them up get them to the side and, and that's really nice if i've got it on camera i tend to be in ttl uh, minus two exposure to get started is a really good place to be uh, and then really just working from there for something to lay on, um, this question is really good actually because it's super practical um, a bivy bag i have one in the bag all the time um, cheap like 15 pound from amazon green bivy bag super waterproof pull it out lay it on the floor it's the full size of me so i can just lay on it um and it just keeps me you know a little bit um you know i don't get wet from the ground that's really nice uh one thing i also do use especially when it's cold like it is at the moment taking along a um a roll up um camping mat or anything like that that you slide inside the bivy bag it's going to give you a bit more warmth from the ground um and it's also going to just you know keep you there for longer and, and keep you dry that's really good um, what other questions have we got here? Makes of camera trap. You know, I use Bushnells, I always have. Um, they're just really good. I find them super reliable and they just work in any conditions. I mean, I've had ones like almost fully submerged and, and they've worked really, really well um, for me. Uh, the battery life's really nice as well. That's really good. Um, has anyone stole them? No, I'm so lucky at the moment. I've, I've never had any equipment stolen out in the field. Um, I tend to find that if you position it very well, carefully away from um, paths and stuff like that, um, trying to keep it really blended in, you'll notice that I spray paint all of mine so they look a very natural colour. That can really help reduce like the number of people who are uh, seeing them or you know actually like finding them out in the location. And where I put them, I, I've never lost one. I worked on a project photographing otters in. Um, in the middle of Cork City in Ireland and I didn't lose a camera trap in the whole year by the one that got flooded so um, I think you can really hide them in plain sight if you are if, if you know how to do that uh, let's just look for some more questions do I run any workshops in Hertfordshire um I don't currently but I might do it in the future I haven't really put any workshops out at the moment um because of everything that's going on. And also I just came back from Ireland, so I, I will get working on some new um, workshops in the future. If you check my website, that's tommasonphoto.com or Instagram, anything like that, I will keep people up to date with that. Tripod, um, I'm always using my tripod. I didn't have it in this video because I was lugging a load of gear. Um, I use a Jitsu Systematic, superb for wildlife photography. It's super stable and very reliable and light goes flat to the ground that of course is one of the most important things uh, when it comes to wildlife photography because I can get that low angle on my subject and it supports very heavy lenses um, that is really um, um, good to have. Um, so the best settings for camera trapping um, depends what I'm doing but often I will be working between uh, 
fully manual, um, dialing in a shutter speed, you know, long exposure if I want to get some ambience at night time or keeping it to 200th of a second to just freeze the motion uh, with the flash. Um, sometimes I do use aperture priority if I'm aiming for that kind of shoulder time, you know, um, evening or morning. Um, but most of the time I do tend to be in manual and, and have it about, you know, 200th of a second uh, F11 and then two to three flash guns for what, for what I'm shooting. Um, where can you sell images? Um, all over the place. I think one of the best things at advice if you want to go commercially as a photographer, work local. Start with the people around you, the um, you know the communities that you can get in. It might be local trade markets, local companies, anything like that. Build your work there and then expand from that. I think that's probably the best way you can get started in selling uh, wildlife pictures. Going for the big magazines and everything, you're competing with so many people. So try and work on a local scale, both in the images you take and also the way that you um, kind of put stuff out commercially uh, can be really good indeed. Um, pros and cons of rechargeable batteries. Um, rechargeable, they're just so much more environmentally friendly. You know, throwing away all these batteries all the time, it's just, I, I can't be doing that. Good batteries, lithium ion ones, um, any loops or the Energizer lithium ones, I find they work really well. I've had some of mine for like three years and they're still working absolutely fine with no problem. Well, I'm really sorry, guys. I've tried to get rid of... Um, I just want to answer one more question that's the uh, one about mobility issues. Um, in terms of um, portable hides, there's some really great options um, in terms of, you know, if you, if you are with a wheelchair and things like that, of being able to use the car for a start is great. Use your car, position it along roads and then shoot out the windows. It's great for people who've got mobility problems. Um, if you're with a wheelchair, obviously local nature reserves have great hides and access that we will be able to get back to soon. Um, but also if you use um, some kind of stakes from the side, you can build a hide uh, that you can move around and that works rather well. Um, I've had people also wanting to know of options for tripods for mobility issues. And if you've got a, a super clamp, Manfrotto super clamp with a magic arm is superb. You get tripod level stability, um, stability without having the faff of everything with you. And I, I hope that helps. Um, but I'm really sorry, I'm running out of time. So um, I'm going to have to tie it all up there and say thank you very much for joining me uh, for this session. If you do have more questions, you do have more things you'd like answered, um, get in touch with me via um, Twitter or Instagram. It's at Tom Mason Photo or by my website, uh, www.tommasonphoto.com. I'll be more than happy to answer questions, reply to emails, anything like that. Um, but thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the video and I uh, will um, see you soon. Cheers, guys.